Hi folks, I've uh, just got this poll launched there. So if you want to um, answer that, if you haven't done so already, I said we've got 65 participants already, 59 people have done it. So those of you who've uh, just joined, feel free to um, answer that poll and we'll come back to that. Okay. Um, as I just wrote in the um, uh, chat, so I've got a brain fail, forgive me, in, in the chat, um, the uh, it's an absolutely glorious day out there so i'm kind of amazed that we've got so many people in fact well we've, we've surged up to 67 which is pretty cool and uh so good uh so i owe you an immediate apology for taking away from the nicest day of the year so thank you um i am hoping to see at least a few of you sitting outside somewhere really really nice um I don't know if I've got any of my, I don't think I have any, any of um, my fourth year Zemi say, but we had a very nice moment in my Zemi in the spring where one of our students joined us from by the sea in Santorini in Greece. First of all, we thought it was one of those kind of virtual to haike, one of those, you know, virtual backgrounds. And as we moved, she moved around, we suddenly realized, no, she really is in Greece. That's one of those nice things when you're near you and you can move around, can't go anywhere if you're, um, Australian, for example. Okay, uh, so keep going with the poll. Uh, welcome back to Wasida. Okay, um, I'm I have having looked through the class list, the enrollments. I'm seeing um, lots of student numbers that start with 19, and I know that in the um, fall. Um, of 2020, when we have lots of students with 19 student number, um, 19 is kind of equal to a bucket of tears, okay? Because I know many of you would actually have, uh, if it wasn't for this pandemic, would be somewhere else in the world in a different institution on exchange um, uh, or on a fee-based program from Waseda, but uh, because of the pandemic. Um, so many of you unfortunately have to not only stay at Waseda, but you actually have to do the virtual thing with Waseda. Um, add to that uh, all the complexities, of course, then of uh, trying to take the courses you want to take with more people here than usual. And so I know it must be a pretty frustrating time. Uh, so I'll try my best to, what well, should we say, attenuate? Uh, diminish the uh, the sense of kind of annoyance. Hopefully that you'll you'll sense you get something out of this semester, even though you would much rather be somewhere else. Um, now the very first thing I'm going to say on that is that I know a number of you are in this strange holding pattern with your study abroad. You were supposed to go abroad from the fall this semester. You couldn't, but the option is still potentially open to go in the spring which you know, depends on a few things, depends on the host institution. And um, as much as anything else, it actually depends on the travel advisory that uh, Gaimisho, Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs issues. Um, and then that impacts on whether Waseda will allow you to go, whether you can get travel insurance, all of those kind of things. So I know that a number of you are hoping to be able to get away for the spring. And depending on where, you, where you're planning to go, for example, to Scandinavia, the UK or whatever, um, for some of you that would involve a, a, a January departure. So I wanna say right from the beginning, anyone who's worried, um, partly because we're, we're, we're virtual anyway, um, it, I am absolutely determined to accommodate anyone who has to, to get off on study abroad um, in the spring. Now, don't, therefore say, well, pocket time seemed kind of optimistic, you know, um, I'm not saying I'm optimistic about that actually being able to happen. I'm just simply saying if it can happen, fingers crossed, I hope it can happen for you, then um, I will do everything I can to uh, facilitate that um, in relation to the course. Um, I'll just say in terms of Australia, which I follow particularly closely, and I've got a few friends in quite senior roles in policy and um, uh, in senior roles in leadership positions in universities. I'm, I'm getting more and more worried about the spring 2021 study abroad option in Australia, not because the universities don't want people, but just simply because of the, uh, 
the border dynamics. Um, I can't even get back to Australia now, actually. Uh, there's a, a very tight quota on the number of citizens who can return 30 per flight. Um, and when I checked the cost of a plane ticket to go back, because my mum is quite ill now, um, it was going to cost me Hyakusanjuman to get back to Brisbane in Australia. Um, plus $3,000 for quarantine, which meant that I could have bought my mum and dad a brand new car. Um, so truly crazy days. Um, and if you're feeling the pain of um, being stuck somewhere and not being able to, to get on with some of the things you wanted to do, um, I share that, okay? Um, fortunately for technology, um, we can do some things remotely that in the past we couldn't. Uh, so I've spent the last few weeks trying to help out my own uh, uh, folks to some small degree remotely, but that's always a challenge. Um, and uh, hopefully we can uh, do the same thing educationally. We can, we can achieve things remotely uh, here. There is an interesting open question. It's one thing we will come back to later on um, when we talk about disruption and technology. Um, when the technology permits change, uh, decisions can be taken that in the past might not have been taken. So there is an interesting question about whether we would have, in fact, um, shut down so much of our economy in the first place if we didn't have Zoom. You know, many people are saying, thank God we have Zoom. Imagine how terrible the economic impacts of the shutdown, the lockdown would be. Um, the counter argument is that uh, maybe because of email, because of the technical possibilities of doing things from home and all the rest of it, the societies may have made it a much more hard headed, quite brutal decision in a way to risk the lives of some people um, through a pandemic in order to keep the economy uh, functioning. And uh, that speaks to one of the big sets of kind of trade offs that we will come back to repeatedly in the course because um, enterprise is about uh, creative endeavors, um, normally focused on making money, but not, not exclusively in making money for a whole range of social purposes. Governance is about making sure that resources are not wasted um, and that uh, the social costs of people's entrepreneurial endeavors uh, are not too high. So there's always trade-offs every single day in everything we do, and uh, we'll try and navigate some of those issues um, in the course. Okay, now just looking at the poll here, um, I'm seeing 66 of 68 participating um, have responded. So if the last couple of folks would like to do that, then I'll close it off and then I can actually share the, uh, the results with you. Um, it is quite interesting, actually. The uh, collectively, you're not as worried as I might have imagined, but I think that's that's, probably a consequence of me having in the last so six weeks or two months or whatever having been living to a substantial degree virtually in um the anglo world in terms of media uh where with headline rates of um quarterly economic downturn in the order of say 20 percent of gdp um and huge surges in surges in unemployment or disguised unemployment because governments have been paying to keep people in employment and that raises some interesting things for a course uh then the, then there's very high levels of pessimism um japan although it's had a similar level similar economic dip uh, there are lots of reasons why particularly younger people shouldn't be too worried about at least their medium term prospects uh, for getting a job and whatnot. But we'll, we'll come back to that later on as a discussion. Okay, uh, so response rate there, just two people. Um, I'm gonna close the poll. Okay, you've had a chance. So I'll close the poll and I'll share the results. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna screenshot the results. Excuse me. Okay. So someone's still actually i'm not going to remember that it's supposed to end
that's annoying me. Um, anyway, I'll res read the results out to you. The uh, Zoom is playing up on me and um, I've ended it, but it won't end. <laughs> oh, let's try that again. Okay. Um, something's gone awry with that. So I'll put the results in the chat. Um, supposed to be able to share it. Okay, so how worried are you or your family about the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, what do we see? Um, extremely is only 5%. Okay, um, very 21%. And uh, somewhat, 53%. And not much, 23%. And not at all, 2%. Okay. So, kill that off there. Right. Okay. Now let's get down to some organizational matters. Um, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you this. Uh, you can download this if you haven't already done so from the Moodle website. Um, it's uh, two full pages, very detailed schedule of what we're doing. Okay. And also, better hold it straight. And a bit of a rationale about the structure of the course. Okay. Um, so first things first, um, simply put, uh, as, a, as a rough kind of model of how it works, think of um, Thursday's period two as the regular live session. Uh, there will be a few live sessions on Wednesdays, most importantly for these first two weeks. Of course, one's now is a Wednesday, so we're in a live session. Um, next Wednesday, we'll have a live session as well. I really want to get it um, underway with me as a talking head. Although I'm also very conscious that you just get massive Zoom overload. Um, there's some, actually not Waseda, but uh, lots of universities internationally have been surveying their students and they say that they really just get kind of sick and tired of just watching Zoom all day, every day. Uh, so like I did in the introduction to business course in the spring, I'm doing a hybrid model where I'm gonna be shooting a bunch of videos uh, that will be video on demand, they'll be on the YouTube channel. Um, which you can find. I'll, I'll give you more details about this. Those of you who took Introduction to Business will know that the YouTube channel, very simple. You just go to YouTube and just put in Pokachan, P-O-K-A-C-H-A-N, Pokachan, and you will find my channel. Um, I don't think I'm going to break like Hikakin or someone in Japan. I wish I did. Hikakin last year, the top YouTuber made um, according to his tax return um, and uh, um, his Jimisho statement made um, Nanooku Hasen Man, I think, was his earnings. Uh, so I don't think my view rates on my channel um, of about 200 uh, are going to get me into the monetization category there. So you need no conspiracy theories about I'm trying to turn in myself into a uni vlogger or something like that. Um, there are a couple of advantages of putting material on YouTube. First of all, um, Wasa Network's pretty crap. And uh, we've had some problems with streaming videos. Um, I do hope that a large truck backed up in the uh, summer break and they offloaded some um, more server capacity, but uh, I didn't see it happen. So relying on the squillions of dollars of Google um, YouTube um, for server capacity seems um, a pretty safe, things to, safe thing to do. If the network goes down, we at least have that material out there. There's another huge advantage of putting uh, material on YouTube, and that is just simply that um, with the videos, you can watch it anytime you want, and you can also turn on um, auto captions. So particularly if the sound quality is pretty good on a YouTube video, the auto captioning was so you'll get the English captions. Um, you, you can try auto translate too, but the, um, video captions to, to, to turn it on into English, auto-generated um, by the algorithm with YouTube are pretty accurate. So those of you who are not so comfortable with your English listening, particularly someone like me who talks super fast, um, that can be uh, really helpful. 
okay? And uh, so there will be links from Moodle to YouTube and you can, you can go over there. Now, one of the, uh, the little strange uh, fears that showed up in some of the, uh, the student feedback in the spring semester was some students, they um, subscribed to the Pocket Town channel, got me to a total of 100 and something subscribers. Um, great, <laughs> um, uh, hopefully some more. Uh, some people thought, oh, but if, if I go direct to the channel and I don't go through the Moodle links, there will be no record that I'm actually watching the videos. Don't worry, I'm I'm not looking at that. I'm not, look, not looking at people's engagement through how they go on individual links to videos and whatnot. Um, I did look uh, for a few, in a few marginal cases, uh, where people's performance suggested they were entirely undeserving, but I was wondering whether they deserve charity or not, to see whether they'd done some really basic things like downloaded the lecture notes. And so people who hadn't bothered to download the lecture notes um, and then did spectacularly badly, obviously uh, were less inclined to, have to get favors. So there's a little bit of you know, data I can generate through Moodle in terms of engagement you know, there. But I'm not looking to try and micro analyze um, whether everyone clicked on every single link and everything. Similarly, don't be a smart ass and think, mm, okay, I'm gonna go through, I'm just gonna click on every link and I'm not gonna look at it. And it's gonna look like I'm a super, super active student because actually we can't out of Moodle export one single report um, on everything just one student did. We can go in item by item and we can see who accessed it and who didn't but it's quite a laborious kind of process. And on the significant things like downloading lecture notes, I do do that and I put it into a spreadsheet, um, but on many of those other things, no. So there will be lots of video material that's on, off on a separate course website. You've got the URL, um, which is um, here, okay, up the top, um, www.eb434wordpress.com. Okay, uh, that URL is important because all of the third party video material that I curate, other people's stuff, you know, various things are in the public domain, particularly on YouTube and whatnot. Um, I embed those links there. I'll also put some links in the, uh, the middle page to it, but it's easy to go to the, uh, to the website directly and have a look. But the lecture notes and everything will be available through uh, Moodle, okay? And the video material that I shoot myself uh, will all be on YouTube. So you can uh, go uh, to the channel there. Okay. So um, how's it going to work? Uh, generally, Thursdays are our live sessions. Wednesdays, we're going to use in a range of ways. Uh, we're going to have a couple of live sessions today, next Wednesday. Um, at the end of this year, so just be the last classes before Christmas, we'll have um, two, maybe three sessions, and I'm just going to wait to see what the third um, course registration student numbers deliver us, and I'll know that next Tuesday. Then I'll make a decision, and you'll be put into groups. Um, so we'll either have either two or three sessions for student presentations on the disruption task, which I will talk about. Uh, later on. Um, so one of those Wednesdays will be a live session when uh, people will be doing that. And the uh, the date for that will be um, 16th off the top of my head. Yes. So it'll be uh, definitely 16th and 17th of December, possibly Thursday 10th of December as well. Um, if we don't need the full three classes for the student presentations, then I'll be leading the discussion um, on that uh, first session. Now, the next thing is about uh, assessment, and you'll probably hear this and want to choke. Um, sounds horrible, but actually, let me reassure you that it's actually not so bad. Um, that uh, obviously doing once-off really big exams virtually, it's really horrible, and there are just some pretty profound fairness issues. Um, so what I've decided to do is to have seven short quizzes throughout the semester. Um, multiple choice, um, 15 questions a time. Um, and those questions will generally be pretty easy. Uh, they're really just to uh, encourage you to look at the video material, read the relevant book chapter, um, and it's a, it's a pretty easy read, the book. Okay, and remember this is an advanced course and it's a pretty, it's a pretty, uh, pretty easy read um, for, the, uh, for a course of this level. 
Okay, so there'll be video material, there'll be a few supplementary readings, which I've already included in here to two core ones, um, which I'll talk about again in a moment. Um, and so every two weeks on a Wednesday done in the class time, so period three, uh, the, a quiz will be opened up and you can do it. And it'll be only 15 questions. Um, you'll have 30 minutes to do it, so I think. Um, but it will be in the, uh, the class period. Now, I know a number of you will be wondering why not just allow us to freely do it at our convenience. Um, some of the, uh, the more savvy switched on maybe more scamming inclined ones of you or friends with scammers will under, already anticipate exactly why I'm doing it this way. Um, based on some experience and some, some fairly serious data analysis I did um, of what happened in the large introduction to business class, um, I just realized there are some problems when I do give periods, extend, extended periods of time for people to do quizzes. Um, I was conscious that this would be a risk. The vast majority of people looking at the data seem to have done the right thing. But unfortunately, there were clearly a few people who were screenshotting the questions, sharing them to friends, um, who then uh, did the tests very often, very late in the period, um, stupidly short period of time to do the test and good scores. So um, a couple of conversations have are still underway with several individuals uh, about that, particularly a couple of idiots who logged in at exactly the same time, finished in no time, got exactly the same score, picked exactly the same answer. It's like, duh, you know, it's uh, um, punch yourself in the head kind of uh, uh, private kind of thing. As the military, they observe some, um, so, so some people have an amazing capacity to injure themselves. Um, so not helpful. So in the interest of fairness, I thought the best thing to do is that everyone does the quiz uh, at the same time. That's also why I sent that email a number, oh, that, that message to everyone to the class list a number of days ago. Um, those of you who just registered the course, you didn't get that because you weren't registered. Uh, asking if anyone was going to be in a difficult time zone to let me know. I was kind of waiting until the very last minute to decide um, just when the quiz would be, when, whether it was more of a Wednesday or a Thursday. Um, I'm conscious of the time difference that it, if, if it's, it's pretty much between, between um, um, Mumbai and Lisbon is the problem in terms of the time zones there, um, that it's pretty rough um, in some of those time zones um, when you have to do something kind of live um, right now at this time, okay? Um, but from the feedback I got, it doesn't seem to be anyone is currently in that situation. So I hope that is still the case. Um, to anyone who is in that situation, who's just signed up for the course, the, uh, I think it was the 13 or 14 of you added it in the last in registration, um, my sympathy and uh, do let me uh, know if you're struggling with the time difference. Okay, so some of you may be wondering, but you know, wow, we're going we're to use up all this class time just doing quizzes. Well, yes and no. Um, the quizzes will run in the regular class time, but I had always intended to, through a hybrid model, to have a, one live session and one content on demand model anyway. So I figured it made more sense to use that live session to overcome those problems with the uh, fairness with the test um, and to do it then. And uh, the video on demand, of course, you can, you can uh, watch at any time. Um, one of the, uh, the kind of the odder kind of comments I got back from two people after the introduction to business spring semester was people said, um, but the videos weren't always uploaded in time for the class. And I thought, mm, that's because it's video on demand. You don't actually have to watch them during the class time. You know, the whole point is you can watch them some other time. And, um, in fact, there were huge problems of uh, view rates being really, really bad when I wanted to run the quizzes on them, that particularly with the first year students, I actually decided to delay the quiz several times because I thought, well, it's just gonna bomb these because they haven't even watched the videos. Um, I'm not gonna be delaying quizzes and whatnot because people haven't been watching the videos this time around. So on the other hand, the, uh, the nature of the uh, the quizzes, there'll be a few on the video content, but there'll be, 
it's over a two week period. So you'll have had the content for a while and be able to look at it. And the other key rationale for having the short quizzes is that I just want people to read the relevant chapter in the book before we have a live session. Uh, because I think you're going to get so much more out of the live session if you're actually familiar with the issues in the book. And then I can comfortably refer to issues in the book, knowing that at least the bulk of you have um, um, been looking at it. Uh, in the end, I, I'd, I'd like to think that although it means that you've got to regularly keep up with the work throughout the semester, that you will thank me when we get to January, that crazy busy time. And I was conscious that so many people in the spring, in the last week of July, had this horrible crunch of so many submissions um, due. I was getting messages from people kind of all hours of the, uh, the night and day and people not sleeping and everything. Um, so this kind of spreads it out. Uh, we won't have a final exam in the usual form, um, but I always in this course and most of the courses I run, I always have a final written summative component where there are several very short essay options, um, typically, you know, three to five options that uh, relate to some of the really big themes in the course and just simply test your ability to extract the big picture and to have your own view on it. Okay. Um, so I still want to do that. I'm, I'm making it only 15%. Uh, it's what we traditionally call a kind of a take home exam. So you do the exam at home and then you submit it. Um, what's the difference between a take home and exam and a, um, a regular essay? Well, it's good for you guys because a take home exam means you don't have to do highly you know, nicely formatted, lots of academic references and everything. So it's not, it's not carefully constructing an essay with should be multiple drafts. Um, and, and, of a referencing and everything it is instead like you would do under exam conditions so it's more of an opinion piece um, but with the uh, the benefit of having you know the material at hand when you're doing it and I've set the uh, the deadline for the upload of that will be 25th of January okay um, due 11 59 p.m. on the 25th of January which means that the course is done 25th of January um, now I've got TBC to be confirmed the release date of when I, when I release the task. My, my instinct is to release it just after the, uh, the final live session on the 21st of January. Okay. Um, so to, to set the timer literally and to, to make it available for when we're done there. Um, however, I am conscious that if some students are going to be going on study abroad from the spring in January, then they may be wanting to wrap up their semester here at uh, Waseda um, sooner. So I'm holding off on confirmation of that until we just simply see how that, uh, that situation is evolving. Okay. Um, so just a couple of final things in terms of navigating this um, and thinking about the overall uh, workload. Um, we will have seven quizzes every two weeks, okay? And in the in-between weeks, there will be a drop-in session like I did in the Introduction to Business where I'll be here. Um, uh, I will, as usual, post a Zoom login details and students are welcome to drop in, ask any questions about the course or anything else. Um, it was actually one of the most enjoyable things about spring. Um, it was the equivalent of the kind of corridor conversation, which don't actually get to have that often because normally we're rushing off to a meeting or to another class or something. And uh, I know a few of you are actually availed yourselves of that in the spring and I enjoyed it so much and made some nice connections that I really wanted to build it into what we do here. Also for the group work, that's going to be really important because we will, before the group presentation, have fully five drop-in sessions where group members or representatives of groups can come in and completely interrogate me in terms of, you know, focusing their topic and, uh, and whatnot and uh, really refining it. Um, now, as for the group exercise, as soon as the third group, uh, third course enrollment is finalized, um, for yourselves, the date on that, I th uh, let me grab my piece of paper. Imagine pretty much everyone here is actually enrolled. Otherwise you wouldn't have the login details. Or some of you may have got login details from a friend. Um, please don't share login details to 
Zoom bombers. Okay, we've had no case of that so far, and uh, we we all dread it. But uh, it's it's very much working on trust. Okay, yeah. So third registration for anyone who who hasn't registered um, with SILS is first uh, to second of um, October, and the results they uh, they say will be announced on. Um, late on the 5th or on the 6th, I can tell you that it will be the 6th in the morning, having been up um, well past dawn last night, um, fine tuning various things and having hit refresh countless times. Um, at Larry, maybe you guys saw it earlier than the professors, but I didn't actually get the updated class list um, from the course registration until about um, 7 a.m. this morning. And that's why I resent the, uh, the login details. So I won't know the final list of student participants um, until next week, middle of next week. And then after that, I can assign you to groups. Um, we've got a fair bit of time actually with the, uh, the groups anyway, um, because the presentations will be in December, but the sooner people get to work on it, thinking about topics, um, the better. Um, now, we are um, a fair way into the class now. So just, I want to take as, um, Zoom attendance in the simplest possible way. Um, could everyone just type in chat W1? Okay, and hit return. Good, excellent. Um, also, you can see from that that uh, you get a very good strong sense of how your own name appears. So, good, everyone's using your own name, very, very sensible. You know, if you're calling yourself Mr. X. Um, you know, Bob the donkey or something, uh, then we're not gonna know who you are. Good, thank you very much. That's um, extraordinarily helpful. Okay, the disruption task, um, we're all living with this in, in a sense of a negative sense of COVID disrupt disruption. Um, there are amazing instances everywhere we look and maybe some, some of you guys and please tell us in chat if you're doing this. Um, uh, Uber Eats, for example, that's a classic example of a um, dramatic entrepreneurial um, response to new technologies, obviously the ability of um, digital platforms to support the gig economy, uh, coupled with very old technology, um, backpacks and bicycles, okay, um, and um, Sometimes I do shake my uh, head at the thought of, you know, who who does wake up at six in the morning and um, order someone to deliver McDonald's to them on a bicycle for breakfast? Um, and I'm very conscious of this because one of the things, the only, the only time I tend to eat junky McDonald's breakfast is as a reward for having done all nighters. And so I kind of stagger in and get my uh, breakfast set, you know, which is just fat and salt, but it's pretty good after an all nighter. Um, and then you see all of these people kind of coming in, collecting Uber Eats, McDonald's breakfast. And you think, is civilization advancing or regressing? I, I haven't quite made up my mind. Certainly it is disruptive um, in a sense that we've got several of these businesses doing these things. It presents opportunities for businesses that otherwise would have completely packed up now, particularly with COVID. And there has been this exponential growth in uh, the number of people who are working um, in the gig economy. And wherever you go, there are Uber Eats riders everywhere. It's just, it's just absolutely astonishing. Uh, indeed, in my country, in Australia, a couple of weeks ago, um, officials were stunned. Uh, the federal government was stunned, all the analysts were stunned because they're expecting a dramatic decline in the employment figure. And unexpectedly, employment rose. And for 24 hours, it was this huge, question mark, but all the indicators of the economy has been crushed by the pandemic. Then uh, the Bureau of Statistics looked more closely and they realized that almost all the employment creation was in the sole employee contractor category. And then when they looked closely, realized that um, they were pretty much all Uber Eats uh, delivery uh, riders and the individual income wasn't actually uh, very much. But it has, you know, kept people literally, you know, from living in the streets um, in these difficult times when they've lost other force, um, sources of employment. 
much of the other disruption we're seeing in so many ways, you know, the kind of things that um, have made it easier to, to experience lockdown, for example, Netflix, uh, we'll actually have a bit of a look at the uh, Netflix uh, because it is an interesting case study in several ways. Um, not least because um, some of you may be familiar with this already, Netflix has a, um, a very distinctive, well, not now, lots of people copied it, but a very distinctive philosophy uh, in terms of its employees. And back in about 2006, I think it was, the director of HR and the CEO uh, released this slide stack of 109 slides or something on um, the ethos in relation to employees. And it's pretty confronting um, about, you know, they say being a hard worker, B team performer, um, gets you a nice severance package. So work hard, um, be okay, and we'll generously uh, sack you. Uh, so it's like kind of confronting. Um, on the other hand, Netflix, you're free to take as many holidays as you like. It's completely up to you. They don't track holidays. Um, you, you decide how many days you can afford to take off, conscious, of course, that they will sack you if they don't think you're working very well. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, that has become pretty much the template for HR practices in Silicon Valley. Um, in fact, it's been described as that slide deck is the most significant document to come out of Silicon Valley. And when we talk about new ecologies of business and uh, issues of convergence or the lack thereof of different capitalist systems coming to look more like each other or not, um, it will be very interesting to see the models that particularly the what's often called the new economy in the US provides uh, for the, uh, the world at large. Okay, uh, so organizationally, that's pretty much it. Just simply to emphasize that if you're looking at this and you're wondering about where you should be with the readings and the textbook, um, I've already emailed the, uh, the class this about this, but those of you newly uh, registered, you wouldn't have got that. Um, our um, textbook again is down the bottom, it's on the syllabus as well. Okay, John Micklethwaite and Adrian Woolbridge, the company, short history of revolutionary idea. Um, these guys write well. Um, both of them uh, are on The Economist. The, in fact, um, John Micklethwaite is the editor of The Economist um, magazine these days. Um, so they, they certainly know how to write, okay? Um, so it's a good read. And um, as you'll see in the slides in a moment, most of you will end up working for companies. Um, hopefully some of you will create a company, own a company, okay? Get rich, and then my sort of will chase you for donations. Feel free to say no. Um, and uh, so understanding the uh, origins of the company uh, is, I think, a very valuable thing to do. So when you're wondering where you should be with the text, what I've done is I've just simply put in blue um, the chapters that you should have read in time for each of the quizzes. So as you can see, um, it's pretty evenly spread out. It's just about encouraging you to pace yourself through reading the textbook and to look at the materials uh, around it. As for the split between video on demand and the live sessions, um, generally the more kind of interpretive stitching all the bits together um, and reflections on the text stuff will be live. Um, the explanation of particular concepts and terms they better lend themselves to me doing short to camera pieces. So, okay. Um, little bite sized pieces. I'm going to keep each video quite short. Um, and uh, that will be the, uh, the general structure. And I do plan to circulate a kind of an indicative list of the concepts. I'm still going through the process of literally scrapping and rebuilding all of the past slides um, and significantly expanding the scope of the, uh, the course and throwing some of the stuff out. Um, one of the strangest comments I, I had on the course evaluation last year was, um, actually, well, no, what was it? Was it milestones? And someone sent me a screenshot of it. They sent me a shot of it. Uh, a photo of it, I think. Um, someone had written um, an evaluation, of course. Nanka, um, corporate governance, bakkari te imi wakara nai. I'm like, oh. Radio. Well, it is called Enterprise and Governance. Um, the previous name of the course used to be um, Comparative Corporate Governance. So I thought, well, 
didn't you read the syllabus? Um, so yes, governance uh, I do understand that corporate governance is a bit of a kind of a dry topic for people. You know that if you're a mid manager um, uh, and you're or you're a new employee and you're working for a company that's either about to go bankrupt or about to be taken over or something like that, corporate governance is 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 a big issue for you. So originally, when I came to Wasada, they handed me a list of courses they wanted me to teach and was comparative corporate governance. So there has been this very gradual process of actually chucking out. Um, the dry corporate governance kind of components and turning this into the course I really want it to be. And so I've decided that this time round, with going for the, uh, the video on demand, um, as well as the live sessions, that finally this is a great kikake to really bust it all up and to throw out the bits that I know from the live sessions were kind of people were starting to nod off. Um, so, uh, in, uh, finally, um, Finally, I can share the results of the survey. There you go. That's pretty scary. It was about a 20 minute lag on having pressed the button. Um, you, you should be able to see it. So in short, what the course really is, is um, everything you ever wanted to know or should know about capitalism, but were afraid to ask or couldn't be bothered asking or didn't know who to ask. Okay. Um, and given that uh, we're all going to go out and work in market systems. So in a sense, it's a bit of a one-stop shop for getting your mind around uh, where capitalism has come from, um, where it is today, where it's going, and what are the implications for yourself. And uh, the implications, not just in terms of being a potential in, you know, employee or an entrepreneur in the system, but just as a citizen. Just all of these big debates about inequality, aging society, globalization, economic nationalism, you know, regional disparities, you know, booming cities, poor regions, which is often exaggerated, by the way, especially in Japanese case, but we'll look at some examples of how that's the case. Um, so getting around all of these, these kind of issues that just dominate the media. So I, I, I really want to emphasize that it's not a really dry course for accountants or lawyers or, a, or, a, or an extension of business finance. There is a finance component, but in, in a sense, it's the capstone end of what my introduction of business course sets out to be. The introduction of business course shows the really basic aspects of business relevant to anyone. Um, who is a consumer, whether they're going to work for an MPO or whatever, or go and work for a company um, or wants to, create a business and then this is at a more advanced level kind of joining up all the dots you know how how does business and market systems fit together with our broader institutions and what does it mean for us and actually uh, there are some some interesting issues and we'll look at uh, in terms of the relationship between the rise in the mass company and the rise of higher education of universities um, it's not something that's discussed as often as it should be but the modern large enterprise where people were a salaried white collar worker really grew in tandem, hand in hand, uh, with the modern university. Uh, effectively, the demand for higher education grew rapidly because people knew that if they were a graduate from a university, they were certified as supposedly studious um, or if not studious, at least super smart, and uh, were therefore likely to be employed in companies and have a career path, okay? And that's why, of course, people get so focused on going to prestigious universities because they see payoffs in terms of selling themselves in the market system subsequently. So how all those things fit together are interesting. And also with increasing questions of specialization, specialist versus general knowledge in the context of rapidly changing worlds, um, both for business and for individuals, the implications. So we'll we'll talk about some of those things. So that's why history matters. Uh, but the history is always there to show what doesn't change and what has changed, and also how uh, you, one can ad effectively adapt to changes. Okay, so let's turn to our slides. Um, unless, or oh, indeed, let's uh, we'll go to the slides, and you can think about it feel free to ask any questions you might have about the assessment through the chat, okay? So if there's anything you want to know, um, add it there, okay? 
Um, but I'll go and I'll, I'll do the uh, screen share straight away. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Um, based on experience from last semester, I think it's safer to actually um, share the PDF which you yourselves have um, through Moodle than to run a keynote. Keynote sometimes um, locks up and causes problems. So it's a little bit funny the way I'm going to be scrolling down a uh, continuous PDF, but uh, that's the safer thing to do. Okay, so enterprise. Um, when I renamed this course, I uh, you know, thought about various terms for engaging. Um, I was very conscious that I wanted to bridge the economics and business cluster and the governance cluster. So governance was an obvious thing to put in the title. Um, but enterprise is a particularly good word because enterprise, um, though it has a business orientation, uh, is also a very nice adjective. We talk about someone being enterprising. It doesn't necessarily mean they're pursuing money, that they're quite uh, resourceful. As in our second definition here, they show initiative or resourcefulness to achieve whatever goal they want to do. And so I really uh, want to have a very broad notion of enterprise uh, because actually some of the most significant sectors out there in terms of growth and employment, share of GDP, are actually not for profit. Uh, Australia's second largest export industry after iron, air, iron ore um, is actually higher education, um, which why universities are in an absolute crisis now in Australia because Australian borders are closed. Um, and all of the universities like uh, Waseda are not for profit institutions. Of course, international students paying high fees probably don't feel it like that, um, but the uh, the fees they pay go towards investing in the university, cross subsidizing research, frankly, cross subsidizing the domestic students. So that's a set of issues. Um, but also other fields, not just education, but areas such as health. Health um, now is the single largest um, employment sector in many developed economies. And in terms of predictions of future employment growth, um, it is the most promising sector. So health and ancillary uh, services, you know, with aging populations and whatnot, it's not a surprise. So enterprise, a project or undertaking, especially a bold or a compl complex one. Um, that sounds pretty cool, bold and complex ones. Okay, we'd all like to be bold. Don't know if we wanna be complex, but that's good. We wanna show initiative and resourcefulness of course, relating to a business or a company and entrepreneurial economic activity. Now, of course, you know, society um, and firms, the relationship is complicated, both in positive and negative way. Clearly, capitalist economies, corporations, companies contribute enormously to uh, wealth creation. Um, in my country, Australia, half of all taxes um, from corporate services, um, from, from corporate entities, the other half of the tax take, um, of the direct tax take is uh, from individuals' income, then there's indirect taxes, of, you know, um, sure he's a consumption tax and whatnot. Now, of course, the innovation that comes out of companies has a huge impact in terms of customers. If you think of how we spend our days, um, particularly in this virtual age, it entirely is down to entrepreneurs. We've got a lot of technological advancement, but then these people who take emerging technologies, find interesting applications, get the business models right, um, make them uh, available to us, uh, have a really transformative impact uh, on our lives. I mean, the very fact that we're actually, you know, under uh, a pandemic actually continuing with education virtually, you know, is thanks to the smart folks, the likes of Zoom and uh, other places. But of course, corporations too benefit enormously from social stability. You know, you're not going to go the trouble of creating a, a company, a business, if someone's just going to come along and, excuse the expression, steal your shit. You know, uh, if the government has... Uh, a sufficient capacity to maintain public order, to enforce property rights, uh, you have greater confidence that investing in creating a business will be something that's worthwhile doing. 
we, we need sound institutions of public governance. We need a very effective legal system um, for uh, redress when uh, there are um, arguments you know, about you promise to do this and pay this much and blah, 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 blah. Um, one can argue perhaps in some countries we have uh, too many lawyers um, and that everything gets uh, reduced to a contractual view of the world. Or I think interestingly, in the context of the pandemic, we see very different approaches to the public health issues. And one of the striking things, and this is a conversation we'll come back to later in the course, is that a lot of Western societies have actually shown themselves to be very quick to use strong state authority. This very striking idea that you can't really trust people to do the right thing. You have to therefore put strict rules in place, enforcement, um, penalties. So we see in Victoria, in the uh, state of Victoria, in Australia, for example, in Melbourne, um, they went from early on in the pandemic saying you don't need to wear a mask, it's silly, to a $200 fine if you don't wear a mask. Even some guy out in some rural area fishing by himself can get fined if he's not wearing a mask, which from a Japanese perspective is absolutely idiotic. Um, so we do see some societies have a more voluntaristic kind of approach. And actually one of the really striking things I think that we see from um, the COVID pandemic is that, you know, although many people had these image of Japan as having a very strong state and compliant population, we've discovered that actually Japan legally um, has probably one of the weakest governments in the world in terms of its ability to actually do basic things like pass a law or, or to require people to stay in their home. Um, so as a consequence, what Japan has been able to do quite effectively is to encourage people through communications to do the right thing. And then there's all these culturalist kind of arguments, but then culture, of course, is created in that context. So that's one of the interesting conversations we'll have. Um, are people good simply because they're forced to be good? Are they afraid of punishments? Or are they educated to be good? Do they internalize certain values? And so we'll look at various case studies to get at this at the company level, but at the societal level. And the COVID pandemic is this interesting prism through which we can see so many different aspects of our society revealed in ways that uh, have been quite surprising for astute observers. Back to the benefits corporations get from society. There's a lot of corporate law and whatnot, which um, helps companies. Um, one of the things that I do have to really add to in this course, and one of the tragic consequences of the COVID pandemic, is we need to talk a lot more about bankruptcy, insolvency. What, happen, what happens when companies go bankrupt? Um, I uh, still somewhere have a couple of printouts of plane tickets to Australia on. Um, Virgin Australian Airlines. Uh, of course, the planes didn't fly. Uh, they have offered me a voucher. Um, and they promised that that voucher uh, might be valuable if the new owners of the airline, um, Bain Capital of America, when the bankruptcy proceedings are finished, that they uh, said that they plan to one of those vouchers. I also have here somewhere a, uh, a printout of my ownership of Virgin Australia shares that I bought in quite a number of years ago for several thousands of dollars, which are now worth zero. So I've plane tickets I can't use, and I've watched thousands of dollars of shareholder value, my shareholder value, um, completely disappear. And Bain Capital effectively picked up um, the, uh, the business uh, for not very much on the understanding that they will put money in and keep various stakeholders, a number of their employees and whatnot um, on and try and do the right thing by customers who've lost out. So I, I have quite a uh, collection from the last couple of months on some of these fundamental issues of liability, um, limited liability, our business can fail and you can walk away. And if you want to look at losses and tax treatment issues and whatnot, uh, you only have to go to the New York Times today. Um, and I, th I think it's probably just finished the debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. We have this surreal thing where it turns out that um, Donald Trump, I think last year paid $750 in tax 
and Joe Biden paid $250,000 um, in tax to the uh, federal government uh, because of the tax treatment of losses under the US Tax Act. Um, Donald Trump has been able to, for many, many years, not pay taxes. So a lot of these things are, are ultimately political. Rules that governments have made are about things like liabilities and the tax treatment of liabilities. And so there's, there's a complex political economy story here and companies often benefit very much from this. Um, in the US case, we have this notion of chapter 11 bankruptcy, where literally companies that are failing that owe money to people are protected from the people um, who are making claims saying, give me my money back, you bastards, you haven't paid me, that they're actually protected from the creditors uh, so that they can continue to operate. Now, there are certain social advantages, but there are also implications for people having to suffer losses as well. Those of you taking the Introduction to Business course have heard me say that one of the very first things I ever did um, as a, in business, um, I uh, was a freelance photographer, started um, taking photographs for, for people um, in still when I was high school. Um, never got paid by one chap, even though he drove a Mercedes, because ostensibly he went bankrupt. Um, so he didn't pay the high school kid, but he still drove a Mercedes. And you could do that uh, under the way the bankruptcy rules uh, work. Of course, corporations benefit enormously from public infrastructure. They benefit very greatly from human resources. We have public education systems, which means that um, companies have employees who can read, can write, uh, have analytical capabilities. And in many societies, in fact, uh, governments pay for university education all the way uh, to graduate school level, not in Japan, uh, for the most part. And of course, um, corporations can also benefit when um, industries and markets are regulated that protect them from competition. And that's a very controversial set of issues. So as for governance, okay, it's the act, the process, or the power um, of governing um, it also describes processes and systems by which an organization, a resource, or domain is governed. Um, and it's also often referred to as the art of steering societies and organizations. And we'll come back to this, but there is a bit of a distinction between managing and governing. Managing implies more hands-on, day-to-day, um, in an extreme sense, we often call it micromanaging, uh, strategic management, the discourse of strategic management is to separate the uh, broad strategy from day-to-day -day tactics and supervision and control. And we've got a whole lot of adjectives um, and nouns that I will go through and define and, and distinguish. Um, at this point, we need to understand that governance is seen in some sense as setting the broad direction and this notion of steering, uh, we see this with metaphors used for, for powerful leaders. Um, Chairman Mao in China, often referred to as the great helmsman. Um, Xi Jinping sometimes gets referred to as this now. He's got kind of Mao aspirations, I think, in terms of wanting to secure his place in history. Okay, so the great helmsman, um, this idea that he you know, sets the broad direction of where the, uh, you know, the ship will go, but then has a whole crew, um, each with their area of expertise, working to make sure the ship goes in the right direction, okay? Um, uh, although if your image of a ship is more Pirates of the Caribbean, um, I don't know so much governance, um, and particularly if you've been following the news about Johnny Depp and um, his recent um, legal battles, defamation case with his ex-wife, um, Amber, in a court in London, um, that old thing about, well, govern yourself before you can govern, govern someone else um, is an interesting adage. Um, broader issues arise with governance in terms of leadership and legitimacy. Um, and how do you mobilize people for a goal, except the legitimacy of both your leadership and the strategic direction you want to set? Um, I find it generally tacky, but I love it. Uh, socialist realist art. Uh, and I, this, the Soviets did some okay stuff, but particularly Chinese socialist realist art is amazing. I actually, both of these pictures I took, the huge paintings in the Shanghai um, Public Art Gallery 
maybe enormous paintings, you know, from uh, days of revolutionary fervor, so in people working all as one in a direction to, to build the nation under the, uh, the wise direction of the great leader, okay? Uh, so we'll talk a lot about these issues of kind of leadership and the sources of legitimacy. Um, one of the interesting things in the Japanese context, and I, I, I personally do s think this, is often said that Japan generally has weak leaders, but what is distinctive about Japan is that it doesn't really matter um, for the very simple reason that most people do the right thing. <laughs> So the kind of organization continues because people kind of do the right thing. Um, I think I see that in so many cases. Um, I must say, I'm actually quite optimistic about uh, Suga-san. Um, we can talk further about that. He uh, is this kind of quiet guy who just worked away loyally um, and has actually quite an ambitious reform agenda. So it's, it's a very distinctive um, Japanese culture of leadership to just kind of get yourself in the right place and then nudge um, the change that you want to see. Well, a lot of our conversations, because we're focused primarily on market systems, will be about private governance, but we have to think of private governance and public governance context. Um, and we've got various terms, public governance, private governance, corporate governance, um, and this notion of steering them we'll come back to. Uh, what we see with the COVID-19 pandemic is that the two things are completely inseparable. And what's astonishing um, when we think about the history of capitalism with COVID-19 is that really this is the first time that economies will go into a deep recession. Many companies would fail. People will lose their jobs because governments shut um, private economic and social activity down for public health reasons. And that's, that's not to fault those decisions. I mean, what, what price is human life? Well, actually, we quite routinely do put a price on human life when um, governments decide whether they will allow insurance to cover a certain new expensive drug or something, for example. Um, and courts routinely do put a price on a human life when paying compensation after accidents and whatnot. But these are really difficult issues. And what we see is that the state in many societies through lockdown provisions have wiped out um, lots of businesses or have been in danger of wiping them out. And therefore the state has stepped in to help those enterprises. Um, in my country, the government put a job keeper scheme in place, which meant that the public deficit, unlike Japan, was about to disappear and Australia was about to go into surplus this year and um, the government spent something like $120 billion in a year on JobKeeper. Um, there are lots of people who actually have earned more in the last six months in Australia than they were before COVID-19 because the government prioritized just simply getting money out into the economy. So public and private governance are deeply interdependent. And that's before we even think about the large sections of the economy that are actually run by governments. Now, of course, firms can impose lots of social costs. We'll come back to these concepts, but the notion of negative externalities. So a negative externality is just an, something external to a transaction that two people are happy with. For example, I, I go to a ramen shop, um, Ippudo, for example, Tonkotsu ramen place. You know, if I like Tonkotsu, um, they're happy to sell it to me. I'm happy to eat it. But all of those people who live near the ramen shop who have to smell the d truly disgusting smell of pork bones being boiled to make soup, it is pretty gross. Um, never ever rent an apartment that has a tonkotsu ramen shop in the, uh, the ground floor. Um, yeah, I, I really do get um, Islamic and Jewish uh, aversion to eating pig if you smell pig bones boiling, it's pretty gross, okay? Um, so those negative externalities, you know, any kind of pollution, for example, are not built into the price. And they are ubiquitous. We, we, we see them everywhere, okay? You know, the, uh, the landlord of the building you own rents um, the apartment next door to a bunch of gangsters, okay? 
and then suddenly the quality of the neighbor is uh, the neighborhood is diminished um, but uh, the landlord really needs the rent and the gangster needs a place to live and uh, other people suffer and are not compensated for that. Another key notion is this, this rent extraction. We'll come back to and I'll also do a video very specifically about this. This is where through either market power or political influence, uh, firms get in a power posi powerful position to be able to rip off others. One interesting thing that Prime Minister Sugar is looking to do is to create more competitive pressure uh, on the major mobile phone companies because he thinks that um, consumers in Japan are still paying too much for their mobile phones. It has gotten better. Um, I was astonished. I switched to UQ Mobile from Dokomo and saved a fortune. Um, but uh, arguably prices can go down even more. By the way, I was drawn to UQ Mobile for the very simple reason that I'm a graduate of University of Queensland, which everyone's called UQ, um, and it turned out to be pretty good and owned by AU. Um, so we do know from uh, Japan, uh, with the tragedy a decade ago um, of the triple disaster, that uh, decisions taken by companies can have long-term, unexpected, dramatic consequences. The tragedy of what we see with Fukushima, for example, and the sighting there, um, and you know it's tough for employees in the organization I, I actually when i did my doctorate at australian national university uh, the classmate who was doing a master's degree in the same program um lovely chap who was sent by tokyo uh, electric power company tepco and his main job was actually nuclear power siting <laughs> and they're sending to do a master's degree at um, anu on uh, effectively environmental economics and whatnot so Remember, he, he had a hell of a time 10 years ago when uh, th this happened. And lovely guy, he thought he was going to work for TEPCO because it looked like an incredibly stable company. What could go wrong with an electric power company? Well, a lot could go wrong, and particularly for the affected communities as well. So state influence is also ubiquitous on enterprise. So companies are affecting society and affecting the state, but the other way around. And I've just got some examples here where I'll, I'll, I'll tell the answers straight away. Just a few simple questions. You go to a bank and you want to have multiple bank accounts in Japan, the banks will very often tell you no. Um, and the reason is because behind the scenes, there is this kind of payoff rule where um, the compensation for losses of bank deposits, if a bank was to collapse and the, the government guarantees um, deposits in a bank account up to a certain amount, the banks to keep track of your relationship balance prefer you to have a single account. They don't have to do it that way, um, but that's the lazy thing that banks do. But behind it is a regulation. Um, similarly, if you go into uh, any kind of bank in Japan and wants to sell an investment product, very often they will require you to tick a form, uh, sign a form that says you are not a US green card holder. Why? Um, Anyone who has tax liabilities in the United States um, or has residence in the United States or, and therefore tax, potential tax liabilities, financial institutions are required to submit reports um, to US tax authorities. And it's Mendoxa, it's troublesome. So they'd rather not have those kind of customers. So here you get a US tax policy impacting on what um, Japanese, um, financial institutions will or will not do. And very importantly, it doesn't mean that the product is related to the US. It's just simply that if you uh, have to pay taxes in the US and green card holders have to do an annual tax return, unlike Australians, we only have to declare ourselves a non-resident. I haven't done a tax return for Australia since 2004. Okay, I'm a non-resident, so the government just doesn't worry about me, unlike US green card holders. That's why lots of people give up their green cards, actually. So this set of rules impacts on transactions between Japanese citizens, for example, and Japanese banks. Another one, again, with Japanese banks, banks, lots of Japanese banks have done away with international cash cards. So actually two reasons. Um, uh, they have to pay a per card fee to the likes of Visa or the payment consortiums and lots of Japanese weren't using it. Um, so they save a little bit of money. Um, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, I choke. Um, 
The larger reason is money laundering provisions. Because Japan has this quirky thing where you have a techo and you can also have a cash card. And the authorities became worried that um, someone could have the cash card overseas and someone else in Japan could have the techo, the account, and you could use that to do deposits and withdraw money overseas and money laundering. Although it's actually silly because you can still do a deposit knowing just the account details anyway without the techo. So, but anyway, some bureaucrat decided that and therefore the banks did away with um, cash cards and then instead you have to get a visa debit card thing or some, something like that. And why, do, why doesn't Waseda take more students despite the strong demand to study here? Australian universities are free to take as many students who want to come. Um, fee paying students. Government subsidize the, uh, there's a quota. The government will only subsidize so many, but um, Australian universities are free to recruit as many as they want. And that's why Australia universities turned education into the country's second largest export. Well, I think many of you know, um, because it's so Atari Mai in Japan, that there is a Tein, uh, there is a Waku, there is a number of students um, set by the Ministry of Education. Um, and we are required to hit that target. But historically, Waseda and other universities completely ignored the rules. They didn't care. They massively over-enrolled. Um, and it was only in the early 1970s um, with the Tanaka government that they started giving hojokin, so government assistance to universities, as a carrot for the universities to actually cooperate with the targets and actually... Um, Wasser's just had some issues and Sills have just had some issues because uh, our um, Tetsuzuki Ritsu, uh, people who newly joined Sills in the spring, um, our, uh, we had more people accept than we expected, which was a very nice thing. And we were in danger of exceeding our quota and the ministry withholding what to my mind is actually a fairly lousy amount of money that they give. It's only like 8% of total Wasser's total budget is actually from the government in the first place it's it's you know japanese bureaucrats really want to buy cheap people cheaply uh, they want a lot of control without giving much money but anyway we've we've managed to do some adjustments um so effectively you've got this very strange regulation of quotas um on the other hand there are no price controls on private universities in japan only on public universities so each system tends to have its own eccentricities Let's ask ourselves, why should we study the company? Well, most of you are going to work for a company, okay? Um, corporations play a leading role in most societies. Corporate failures have a major impact. As we see more bankruptcies, people are going to realize this. I've been now victim of four airline bankruptcies, okay? Um, the first time round, I uh, had an old American boss when I was still working for an Australian business school, and he said, Chris, um, you're not a real adult until you've um, suffered from an airline bankruptcy. I thought that was a very American perspective. Um, but then he told me this litany of, you know, stories of losing money with Pan Am and, and whatnot. Okay. Um, and a lot of people are going to see this, that what actually happens when businesses fail um, owing you a product uh, or a service. And there's a lot of people have been very badly kind of caught out. But, Looking through at the corporation and their governance is a good way of understanding how different societies work, economic systems work. Um, also, when we have weak economies, there are lots of distributional conflicts. One of the really basic political economy lessons is actually prosperity brings peace because you can be kind of generous. You can cross subsidize people. You can buy people off. When the economy is shrinking, Politics gets nastier. Everybody is fighting for a share of a shrinking pie. And then it, it starts to look like that musical chairs, you know, where the music stops and you've taken away another chair. And uh, this, unfortunately, in companies in, in hard times, uh, too, it can be pretty ugly. It, it does look like one of those reality TV kind of survivor games or voting people out of the house or or whatever, cooking, you know, there's, there's a whole genre of them these days. Well, unfortunately, one reason why people like to watch those kind of things is it does mirror very often what happens in society in difficult times, okay? Also, many of the conflicts we see in society come down to this question of what, how much should a company be responsible for it, 
uh, to its shareholders, to the owners of the business formally, versus a broader range of, of stakeholders. Remember, Donald Trump and the, the New York Times exposure of all, someone leaked all his tax returns to him, uh, to the New York Times. The analysis yesterday made it very clear the only thing that saved Donald Trump from complete bankruptcy was the couple of hundred million dollars he could make from the franchise associated with the, uh, the TV show, The Apprentice. Um, and there were huge banners in Times Square and whatnot, Donald Trump standing there, you're fired, okay? In America, that resonates. The tough entrepreneur who fires someone who's not up to it. That just doesn't work in a cultural context such as Japan as public entertainment. Um, so Donald Trump in himself tells us so much about um, the very distinctive American culture in relation to stakeholders. That said, the United States also has a tradition of the law um, being incredibly tough on companies to protect societal stakeholders. The United States in many ways, particularly in places like California, um, have driven pollution standards, um, a very strong sense of public responsibility for accidents, for example, product failures and whatnot. So also if we study governance of the corporation, we get insights into some really key things that economists and business scholars talk about, and I'll do some short videos on them, agency, decision, risks, and markets. So in short, what's the course about? It's about the rich variety of capitalisms, and we'll look at the historical development of the business firm, um, and we'll look at particularly how the governance of the private institution of the firm is patterned by the structures of public governance, and how this varies across um, countries and across time. And you can read that in greater detail um, yourself. Just want to emphasize that each society can be understood as having its own distinctive system logics. That, that That's kind of a package, okay? Um, there are, we talk about unique historical settlements and we'll talk further about this. Um, things go together. There are elements of Japan, um, the way the education system works, the way companies, hiring systems work, um, promotion systems, the external labor market, all of these things um, fit together as a package. Um, they change over time, uh, but often they change less quickly than some reformers might like because there are complementary aspects. You know, the, the Netflix approach to firing people you no longer need who were once good employees and giving them a generous payout works well in America because people can quickly get a job elsewhere. That was less the case in Japan. It's becoming more so um, in some industries. And very importantly, these system logics, it's not just understandable through economic theory. We also need political science, sociology, psychology, communications theory. Um, very importantly, the kind of the stories we tell ourselves about our values um, have a huge impact. Um, so the key cultural context, the social institutions around us, um, that by the way, if you're wondering, is the beautiful cathedral next to the University of Copenhagen in um, Denmark. So very distinctive um, Protestant ethos, ethos in Scandinavia helps to explain why Scandinavia developed the social welfare systems and the unique model of capitalism that it did. And we'll actually have a case study on that. So issues in the course, in short, varieties of capitalism, determinants of these variants, consequences, prospects and direction of change, what elements are universal across societies, issues of risk and resources, big issues of, of distribution, inequality, and how societies are more or less accepting of inequality. And um, one of the supplementary readings is going to ask the really big questions of what happens with AI, uh, the revolution in robotics, um, digitization, what's this going to do for inequality? And this is going to be one of our really big themes when we talk about uh, disruption as well too. Um, and uh, of course the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So some other issues, um, trying to figure out which varieties of capitalism 
seem better suited to these potential changes with things like aging societies, with AI automation, because this uh, goes to the heart of an issue of what we call adaptive efficiency. This is from a very famous scholar called Douglas North, passed away a few years ago. Um, we'll talk more about this notion. Uh, it very much works at an individual level, at a city, at a regional, at a national level. The ability to adaptive, uh, adapt efficiently to a changing environment um, will be critical to long-term success. And in the interface of all these different aspects of social systems, education, training system, HR systems, um, you know, how societies adjust to failure. Um, one of my favorite expressions in Japanese, my variant of an Australian version is koramo kikaro chiru. Um, supposed to be saru, but um, even koalas fall from trees. Um, so it's everyone screws up. It's how you actually deal with the screw up is actually uh, critical to individual success. And we see it's critical to organizational and indeed societal success. And we've got some really big things about demographic constraints. There are lots of people who want to say that Japan doesn't have a future because it's got an aging population. We really want to interrogate that and see whether that's actually true. Then there's a whole list of firm, firm level issues that we'll dive into. I won't read through them now. We, we, we're going to be, um, deeply embedded in them. Um, I just want to finish up uh, with a response to the now cliche about uh, the backlash against neoliberalism. Um, we'll talk further about this. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a lazy cliche. There, there are some valid points in it insofar as neoliberalism is always simply about marketization. Um, but uh, some of it is, is mistaken. And uh, one of the common criticisms of supposed neoliberalism is that it, it emphasizes um, free markets and free markets just means companies are free to rip people off. And uh, so the first and last thing I really want to emphasize here today is that, um, and actually, it's a basic premise of economics that in competitive markets and perfect com something and close to perfect competition, businesses are actually unfree. When there's intense competition, you have to be constantly innovating to try and maintain your market position. There's always going to be people, going to be people who disrupt your industry. And uh, so if we think of this in terms of rapidly changing world, we need a capacity for continuing learning ourselves. We need this adaptive efficiency. So ironically, people misinterpret the basic lesson from economics, that the, the freer, in a sense, the more competitive the market is, the less free um, individuals are. And that helps us to, in, in a sense, to rip other people off. That helps us to understand why lots of liberal economists argue that we should have free markets for social democracy, which may seem counterintuitive to some of you, but we will explore that because one of the secrets of, for example, the Nordic economies is that they are actually very um, market oriented, very market conforming societies. And they really want to help people to succeed in markets. And those who are unfortunate in markets get lots of support from the state. Okay. Now just looking at the time there, I've zoomed through that a little bit too quickly. Well, that's a bad pun in the zoom. Yeah, zoom through and zoomed on zoom. Okay. Um, any questions about assessment and whatnot? Anybody? No. Okay. Well, if we don't have them then, um, we'll wrap it up for today. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, 1040, we'll have another live session and I will um, put up a set of slides tonight. Um, they're almost made. I've just got to add um, a bit more data. Um, what I am going to do tomorrow is actually a, a kind of a walk through data, which sounds tedious, but don't, don't be discouraged because uh, the data is actually some really interesting things like um, indices of like poverty, happiness, a whole bunch of things, um, entrepreneurship, and um, to get a, an overall picture of how some market systems work better than others. Some, some ostensibly capitalist societies, pretty crappy places that 
like no one wants to live in them if you know if they could possibly get out of it and lots of other places of course are always ranking in terms of the most desired destinations for migrants and whatnot so we'll have a look at that data and we'll try and um in, interpret some of our statistics there uh see some of the pictures and uh then the following class we'll get into a discussion about the market system those of you who've done introduction to business um, will already be familiar with the work um, there. I'm going to talk about Charles Lindblom and his very famous discussion of the market system. Okay, uh, great question uh, from Takaharu. Uh, thank you. Um, is the recording of this lecture going to be uploaded to um, Moodle? It is definitely going to be uploaded, but I'm going to upload it to my YouTube channel, Pokachan, and I'm going to put a link on Moodle to it. Okay. Um, I will try and edit up tonight, but it, it may be a day or two before I do it. Um, the main thing is it's actually a pretty large file and um, the editing is easy, but the uploading from Wasada um, to YouTube, uh, I have about a 30% success rate. Um, more than two thirds of all the uploads fail and I have to keep re redoing them. Okay, so I'll try and do that tonight, but within a couple of days, it will definitely be there. Um, also, by the way, I will do this for all the live sessions. And also what I do is when we will have breakout sessions in some classes. And what I do is I go in and I edit out where students appear in the video. So the only video that gets uploaded, the recording is of me. Okay. And a final thing I want to say in that is when we do the breakouts, I have a big honor guy. I want people to put their camera on. Uh, last semester, we had a couple of occasions where a couple of guys were being stupid and they had their cameras off and giving girls a hassle and whatnot. Um, so in the interest of accountability, but of course I completely understand some of you don't, you don't want to show your bedroom or you don't want to show where you are or whatever. Um, so remember you have the virtual hike function, you know, the virtual background, you've got those defaults there. I've set the default settings for zoom so that everyone can use that. So if you're worried about those kind of privacy issues, then please use the virtual background. Um, and of course, you know, from a privacy point of view, you know, no one has the right to come to a Wasada class with a paper bag over their head and slits, you know, not showing their face. Um, if you, if you want to come in a burqa because, you know, that's your religious faith, then we'll accommodate that. But other than that, you know, got to have the camera on. So think about the uh, getting your virtual background um, set up if you haven't done that. But I promise that none of you will appear in videos that are edited up and put um, online. Okay. So thanks very much. And I'll see you tomorrow morning and have a look through all the material that's uploaded. And I'm very happy to have an interactive discussion there as well. Okay. Um, question, do you expect us to finish the assigned reading within the um, semester? Um, absolutely. Uh, for the very simple reason that of course the assigned reading is going to be tested every two weeks. So it's, um, it's in your interest and it's not, it's not particularly heavy. Um, so, okay. But, but it is a really good question and uh, look, I'm conscious of time, but just one thing on this, remember it is an advanced course. And I even said this to the first year students. Um, there is a bit of a problem with the kind of Juken culture in Japan. Um, this idea of uh, no, it's the PowerPoints are not enough. You know, universities have libraries for a reason. Okay, we have books, okay, um, but the book, okay, just a sec. It's this. Look, you hit yourself in the head with it, it doesn't even hurt. It's 100, 191 pages and quite chatty, okay, so it's not a big ask for the semester, okay, and there's only two other compulsory uh, readings and then some videos, so it's actually going to be pretty pretty cruisy. Okay. My uh, dictum, I'm very much a modernist in terms of my tastes. Less is more. I don't like to give people too much stuff, but I really want them to get on top of it because I think this is, this is interesting and important stuff. So thank you very much. And I'll uh, see you folks tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>